Okay, now um, this is one interpretation of a an outdoor composting toilet, and it's a batch system. It is not the kind that, like a commercial system that has a built-in temperature-controlled uh, composting chamber. This is a batch system where you actually will fill the buckets and then remove them on a regular basis to, to compost, to complete the composting action else, elsewhere at a, at a uh, another um, uh, dedicated site. The reason we did that was, first of all, we put it on a trailer because at some point we may be able to, uh, you know, with legal, with legal authority, of course, we may be able to take it to events or to other places where we could, we could demonstrate or maybe, you know, people could use it. Um, and, you know, it's easy, it's portable. The size that seemed to make the most sense for a two-holer, the size that seemed to make the most sense was six by eight, it's six feet wide and eight feet long. It could be done almost as well with a, uh, with a five foot trailer, so it's not quite as wide. Um, and we really tried to employ as many um, easily accessible parts and, and components as possible, so we didn't have a big, a big deal in finding things that are difficult to find or expensive things that are difficult to pay for. We made it big enough, there's actually a, a um, hand washing station in there and collection buckets and elements of a real, a real bathroom. So this door is left open so you can see inside there. That door is obviously left open so we could look in there or climb in there without having to worry about the, the uh, door swinging. I would, I would like to build a nice door for this so it, when it's all painted and everything, it'll, it'll just look very nice. It'll be maybe a, a nice, I've got oak scraps, I've got some other, other um, uh, poplar wood and stuff. I may do something you know, pretty, just make the door nice. Um, this other material here, it's, it's all just common common uh, lumber store builder yard uh, material, two by fours, uh, siding, ungrooved, three eighths inch siding. It's weather, uh, it's exterior, so when we paint it, it'll be you know fine for the outside. Typical sort of rural look with the board and batten siding. It's not a true board and batten, but it looks like that. And we'll continue this around the back. We already started there. Um, and. Uh, the basic platform is treated lumber on the bottom, uh, so because it's going to be touching the soil, and the and the uh, weather resistant um, uh, plywood for the floor, and uh, you know that's all for moisture and and uh, and weather weatherization, so we don't lose uh, you know we don't have rot rot issues uh, down the road. This is you know for most people it's not doable but we with the farm equipment we have we have we have a tractor that's big enough to just pick it up take it off the trailer if we have to you know if we decide to put it over here somewhere and just leave it in the ground uh, we could take it off leave it in the trailer it can be used for something else so this was this is the only real modification we did really just to get in and out when you're um, when it's on the trailer now we just cut the cut the tubing and weld some plates on and a hinge, and then it, it can fold back. So, you, know, you can you can get in and out. I have uh, steps, uh, like the child steps for the bathrooms up there. Basically, just a you know one two thing and, and just get in. Um, if it was on the ground, we wouldn't need that. But you know that's what it is here. In the interest of cost, we use simple roll roofing on the top, um, ridge vent or not vent ridge cap for the top, and then. Um, um, you know, that's really it. I mean, there's really no... There are two windows. We didn't cut them in because we didn't really need them right now, but we have the two windows. If we decide we just want more light in the daytime with the door closed, I want to act, I want to uh, uh, ascertain that when we plug it up. Basically, the design concept on the windows was that the right and left, if you're, if you're going to do this yourself, just two, two opposite walls. So the air, when you open them up, the air, there's a cross-flow air ventilation system. So the air can blow through it and help, you know, help take the heat out. In the summer, I'm sure that building can get, you know, get a little hot. The other thing we have here, which again is not necessary, uh, but it is a nod to, you know, making sure that especially if, if there are going to be, a, it's going to be a high traffic of use, there is a small solar photovoltaic system built on here, a, a small 95 watt panel. Well, and I'll take you inside with the, um, when we go inside, I can show you the actual parts in there. But uh, a two deep cycle batteries, a photovoltaic panel, and a controller in there, and some breaker switches. And it's a very, very simple system. It powers a light, 
It powers a fan, and it powers a second minor fan. If we decided that we didn't want to use it, we could always take it off. It wouldn't take 15 minutes to take the whole thing apart and put it, use it someplace else. So solar investment is never a, a bad investment. What's happened here is that that turbine on the, on the other side of the building is a air, is a wind-driven suction turbine that in today, not so much, but in, on a breezy, a little more breezy day, in fact, before it was, it was turning and sucking air up, it is part of the ventilation system for the, for the toilet composting system. So the whole thing is to get air, air, air through the system and to remove odors. If there's any scent, any suggestion of odors or whatever, it's going to go up the stack and, you know, it'll be, it'll be out. If it was less used or if there was a, it was a more windy, an area where there was more of a prevailing breeze and that, and that thing was spinning quite a bit, there would be, really wouldn't be any need for the uh, solar system to be up there because the air would be, you know, blowing through there by itself. Can I jump in? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, to pick up on that, uh, one of the objectives here with this was to get it 99.9% .9 odor free. You know, it, is, it is a batch system to an extent. Let's think of it as an enhanced batch system in here. We're trying to design this, well, we've done it, we're designing this for a lot of different potential uses, which are not simple. It's not just a batch system. It may be used by a handful of people intermittently here on the farm. It might go to an event where you've got people lining up to use the loo. So we've got different parameters built into it. And one of the things is that whenever anybody actually uses it and they walk in and turn the switch, we got another fan that's gonna power it. And I know, I'm pretty sure you're gonna be able to hear this. All right, this is a $24 inexpensive uh, Sureflow Yellowtail fan, which is, right now it's just drawing, obviously from here. When this door is on here, and everything's finished and sealed up, and we're, we're that close, we're eight hours of work to do that, get this on here. But basically what it is, when you open the lid on the squatter, Boom, all the air goes down and all is powered up. I call it turbo air for this. And this is gonna, it can only go intermittently. It's not meant to run all the time, but you walk in, turn it on, the lights will go on, the fan will go on, you go to lift the lid on the, on the seat and then boom, the air's going down in it. So, you know, you think of outhouses, think of porta potties you walk in, <laughs> right away, it's nasty. As soon as you turn this fan on, all this fresh air is being drawn in from the top. There'll be a couple of little leaks, and I'm gonna to get to one other spot here where deliberately we're putting oxygen into here, and it will, be, in essence, pull a vacuum on this chamber where all these containers are in. So all the air is gonna be pulled up, and there'll be a little micro leaks, but we've made this really tight to tolerances. We're gonna finish caulking it off, and it would, it'll be almost airtight. I know I can measure the difference with the, the meters, but uh, it'll be very close to really pulling a vacuum on it. Well, pulling a suction anyway. Now, and th so that fan goes on when you hit the switch and actually use it. Somebody lifts the lid, you get onto it. That's great. What about when you're not? Okay, it just sit there. What about when the turbine isn't fully spinning? What about when it starts getting hot? You've got all these other factors in there, and we don't want it to go anaerobic. That's where the stink comes from. That's where all these trouble, the bulk of these troubles come in. So I got to think, well, how are we going to do this so that it will stay aerobic, even as a batch system sitting in here? And do you want to stand by? I'm going to get the pieces right here I put over here. A little show and tell here. Um, mounted on the left side here, is easier to see from inside, uh, is a 4-inch, 12-volt, uh, permanent magnet DC muffin fan. It's like a big computer fan. Extremely low draw. The best guess is with these batteries charged up out there with nothing on, take the solar off, do nothing else, it should run that fan for over a month before the batteries get killed down. It's extremely low. On a daily basis, it's, it's a negligible load. The light and the fan, the, the one you heard, the big fan that went on, that, that will pull a lot more power than this. Well, and this is why I didn't get done. This cap 
will go over, and what it does is this is drawing in outside air through the muffin fan and blowing it into this chamber. All right, well, you say, well, if you're pumping air in there, you know, where does it go? Well, that's where the exhaust going up naturally and passively is going to want to go with the turbine and the rest. This cap goes over the fitting here, just not done, and then attach this line. I'm going, to have, I'm going to have another T in here, might be easier to see, and have two hoses that drop down from this line, two flexible hoses, so that they will go right across the back of the coolers, and this hose, to, to cut it in half, it looks like it's got the right sizes, will be dropped just into the corners of these buckets, so that there will be a very gentle but non-stop flow of fresh air going into the to the both buckets so that it can't, well, it always could maybe, so it can't go anaerobic just sitting there. We're introducing fresh air into the tanks. And that last part here, inside both of those coolers will have a, a screen or assembly like so that'll be about two inches off the bottom and about an inch off the side formed up that everything sits in. And that's where the air goes down, the bottom, the sides, around it, so that it's, it's got oxygen available in the bucket, in the, excuse me, in the coolers, just sitting there 24-7. So it won't be able to go in aerobic unless it totally fills up with liquid or something like that. And there's a drain for that. We've got a plan for that one as well. But that's why the urine diverter, and you will see inside shortly, that's why that's separated out, to keep this as relatively dry as possible inside, in the buckets where we contain them. And somebody else was asking about it there, so that... Where do you introduce the hose? Through the bucket? Either side. That's why it's flexible. How and, deep will the hose go into the... Uh, we're, well, we're, I'm still debating that. I say it's going to go down uh, about two and a half to three inches from the bottom. Because that'll just clear the bottom of the or clear the top of that drain, in case that's needed there, so it's not actually bubbling into it. But the chances are anywhere that is blowing air into that is going to work fine. We I, I wanted to keep it up a little higher because it'll make it easier to uh, those those containers wheel out slightly, then they'll tip a little bit and it'll relieve any plumbing, and then you can take it out. But you know. You, you, the longer hose will certainly work, but you, it may slap back on you. Yep. You know. <laughs> by, by the way, um, we uh, something like this, you will want a um, cheap set of neoprene or nylon or uh, latex gloves. We have a little place to put all that stuff. So when you're ready to take a batch out, you know, put the gloves on and you know that kind of thing. I mean, it's just. Yeah, is that a job for the interns here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> interns <laughs> wearing latex gloves. Yeah, right. Well, he said with it, and that, and that, that sanitation, <laughs> the same thing, is absolutely crucial at every step. If you get anything from the workshop, it's you got to avoid getting diseases you can't pronounce with it. And that was in our thinking, but to get these coolers as well. It's, a lot of this is obviously a compromise because we're trying to get a lot of different things done. We've actually got spare coolers ready to go. But when they when it gets ready, when you, when you look down and go, oh boy, oh boy, we got ourselves a load and the red one or the blue one, the col we just got the colors there they were. All right, you can pull them back out. The roll the, it's is made specifically to just hold it in that little bit of a run there, so it's not going to floppy. We talked about taking the lid off, putting it back on, but just drop the lid down. Handles come up. And depending on ramps and heights, you've now got a way to walk this around and move it to bring it to the compost pile, because we're assuming this is a back system, obviously. So, the, so when you get there, we'll have a situation where you're close to full. As a longtime composter, you don't wait till it's totally full. Trust me. Once or twice, you'll learn your lesson if you're not paying attention now close to full, make the move. Uh, so when you get to that point, then you're in a position to be able to just dump this out, unload everything, the screening that we're looking at putting in there, would just come out with it. Here we go to the gloves, peel that out, and then it's a matter of just rinsing everything off and getting it clean before you go 
get to ready to bring it back. Now, as I said, we've got spares here, so it's not as if, oh, wait, we got to stop everything. You can pull this out, drop the lid, and you got time to, to come back to it later to dump it out. You don't want to leave it that way for any a day or two. It will go anaerobic. The famous word of what you want to avoid with composting. But it's a combination of things, but it seems like it's, a, it's really going to work for events, for larger uh, issues, or, or higher volume rather, in a shorter period of time. It's entirely possible to put larger trays in here. It would mean going back there to rake it back to give you more room up front so you can, you can get more capacity. But it's going to take a lot of people to fill up two of these buckets. <laughs> It, you know, short order, so you got a head start coming. And then once it's empty, you just slide it back in, lift the lid, push it over there, and then the hose will get tucked in at this point. Yes, Al? So you say if you cover it, it becomes anaerobic, right? Because the air isn't going to get in. Like if you left it outside uncovered with all your mulch on top, then it would stay aerobic. Is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, essentially, yes. It, it, the consistency of the uh, of the humanor pile that you're, you're covering is so it has a bearing on it and the moisture does. But as long, it, in general, as long as you have access to the oxygen, then you're going to stay anaerobic. And I, I, I've heard different numbers, but I'll tell you right now, you cut off the oxygen with too much water, or you know, just seal it like that. Twelve hours, and you are going anaerobic. It does not take long for these puppies to turn sour on you. So that's where I'm coming out with this, adding that little bit of air from the muffin fan to go into here, just to make sure it cannot run out of oxygen. And so you know, there'll be pressure drop along the line and other issues like that, but. It's like just blowing air into it. It will come into this chamber and then go up the shaft or the vent tube to the top. And I have a second question. Are you using the totes for convenience of the totes or also for their insulation? Totally convenient. Okay, so it's the same as a five gallon bucket or any other yeah. vessel. Yeah, it, 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 that's, I mean, that's my view. It was how do we move it? How do we seal it? What about the lid, wheels, carry it? But in terms of the, the R value for it, the, I mean, that would make a difference. Potentially, we could argue it and, and theorize on it, but the real action is happening in the compost pile where it ends up in this particular system. So, I don't know, Let Richard? Me, since, you know, actually, there is some composting that will occur. The start of composting will occur, especially in the summer, uh, right in there. You know, uh, if you, some sources say, oh, nothing, batch systems, there's no composting until it gets out. Well, it will on, on a hot day in the summer. You know, it'll it could get pretty hot in there. So it will, um, it will start to compost. So as, when that happens, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually fluff a little more. The solid material is going to break down. But 60 quarts of liquid, I mean, uh, you know, four is 20, 20 uh, what is that, 15 gallons. Uh, and it's, that's up to the top. It's probably, it's probably more like 11 or something like that. But at, at what, eight pounds? A gallon, make, yeah. But that's why we have the, that's why we have the ramp. And actually, I could have ordered I and mean, could get even a um, four-foot ramp, so it, you could actually wheel it right out. Um, the insulation value is not really a big issue. You know, it, in the, it does have insulation value, but that's, we don't care about that. That's just, uh, you know, if it was, if it was in a system where we had um, uh, somehow we're heating the chamber. With a coil or something within, you know, then it would then it would matter. But these are really for convenience. What I was explaining to somebody before, um, if you wanted to muscle it around, you can get. And I looked; they were $129. A substantial, um, not the thin kind of tote that you'd buy at Lowe's for, you know, for 24 bucks or something like that. Not, but an oblong. It would actually fill this whole. I, f I forgot the, it was like, what, 130 quarts, something like that? It was pretty yeah, big. That sounds right. Lidded, substantial, uh, cellular construction, so it was a you know, fr fairly thick wall. Sorry, but 60. you could, yeah, I mean, it's a heavy, heavy thing, but you could do it. I mean, with two people, you could slip it out here, put it on a wagon, or, and, then, and then deal with it. Um, you know, again, these were the choices we have. We have two backups, so these get rotated out, and the other two fit right there. So there's always, you know, at an event or, or where there's a lot of people, there's always... Um, the, you know, there's always a, a cycle going. 
uh, I want to add to that, and the gentleman has a question. So one of the design parameters as we worked on this in the last couple of weeks, so how do we choose and do this, was can one person deal with it of, of normal medium stature? Right. You know, and, and having a full load like that, it'd be like, you, me, okay, all three of us, let's go, you know, now, unless it's a completely designed system, obviously. So what's easy, now these coolers, they're going to be heavy, but we will find out, this is research, but they're designed to be filled with beer and ice and water and whatever to that capacity, and it won't be that heavy with the compost in there because you're adding in the sawdust, you're adding in the TP, you got all that other space, so it can't be that heavy. So the handles, the wheels, and all that should be the point of no, it's not going to be light to lift up and walk around, but there's no reason you should be able to pop the handle up, drag it over, and then tip the thing over. So that was part of our thinking of how, how does, how will this work at Living Web Farm if an intern says, oh, time to go work on the home, composter. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> <laughs> so we had you in mind. You know, so how to make you know make it really so there, it's a balance on these parameters in here. Uh, so the, the, on the farm, minimal use uh, in terms of just a couple of people and so forth. We'll see, but usually you get weeks, if not a month, perhaps, out of these two just for taking a dump. Now you go to an event, and it, both four buckets could be done in a couple of hours if they're lining up by the burrito truck. You never know, so you got to be careful. But. Uh, the gentleman had a question there. Yeah, once it goes anaerobic, is that reversible by aerating it? Uh, okay. Yes. D redistributing yep. it over the compost pile, or? Uh, yeah. It, once the, the the same bacteria that are or that love oxygen, the aerobic bacteria, take over, and the ones that are they can't they can't thrive in oxygen. That's why they're anaerobic. So it's like the the hog waste and the biogas Richard's mentioned earlier. You never it doesn't work until you shut off the oxygen. Once the anaerobic set doesn't kill off the aerobic set, no, it, it's they, they just they just um, go dormant. Okay, yeah, basically. Yeah, All right. yeah, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't kill, but it, if if there's oxygen, the oxygen loving go wild. If there's not, then the anaerobic take over, and they're still all there, but one's active and one's not. So, kind of like thing. two party system. Think of it that way. Something I haven't heard. What about flies? You think you got that tight enough? I just military. We had the latrine so far no, you, from the kitchen so yeah, far. Yeah, exactly. From, you know, Still, that's that is going to be with the, the cup, seats and the lids. Yeah, exactly. That ain't going to be. Separate. You know. Yeah, that's a, a very good um, a very good point. Everything on here has a screen that fits the pipe. So when this when this pipe goes, uh, well, where, wherever it is, when that goes onto the fan for distribution, there's a screen. I mean, if the lids are down, you've got that gap. The flies are, are no, no gap. Yeah, it's sealed. Yeah, the, it's an the, airtight the seats seal are glued the to the, the seats are glued to the to the. Um, How the interns going to clean them? <laughs> well, you lift you lift the top lid off. Oh. I she, she's like, oh, she's backing away from it now. No, it, it's sealed in terms of the, the for all we get the from from the airflow. So you the we we peeled those little stubs off. Yeah, you see all on the gone. just popped them all off. So everything was flat and then glued the lower part to the to the deck where you would sit, and then the top lid comes up normally. You just to, to just lift it up, but when it goes down, it's also flush. And uh, as Richard said, with the filters in there, with the airflow and somewhere to go, unless you're really introducing a lot of them into there, it's not going to be a, a big deal. I mean, using it, and also, and you turn the fan on when you walk in there, they go with the flow. They'll be. You know, they're gonna be they're gonna be jammed you ever up had on that, that one in your truck. You drive down the road for three hundred yeah. miles with the windows open, yeah. and that thing's still in there yeah. somehow. Well, <laughs> it, that brings up a good point, which actually just has to do with air direction and flow. Even the uh, turbine has a screen, so so when the thing is not spinning, they're not going to come down. But when we're blowing out, I mean, if one gets in. And somehow it gets, through, like, you know, I can't imagine that it gets through the system, then it can't get out. So, you know, that just a clean out. These are very easily, this whole thing is very easily disassembled. We, we did it in what, less than no, less than a minute, I guess, the whole thing. Two screws, pop it off, because that top has to come off for transit. That can't be up there when we move. So that comes off, it's, it just lifts off, and uh, that gets stored here. And then um, uh, there's a screen up there, there's a screen in there, and probably another one outside. Of a, of a different variety, yeah, I mean, different size, you know. I couldn't find a cover that looked good. Yeah. 
for that food. We have a screen for that in, for the intake for the muffin fan for that very low flow. <clears throat> That'll be the one that to me right now. That's uh, the prime entrance. Yeah, that's for bugs really coming in because yeah. it's always a flow going in. So it'll be a very fine mesh screen, which is why it's it's going to choke off a little bit of the flow, but. It's still moving air into there as long as you keep the bugs out. Everything is caulked here. I mean, not it's not all completed yet, but everything is sealed to make this completely airtight. This has a foam gasket around here. The toilet seats, if there is a leak, if there is, if they warp or if, you know, for whatever reason, if we discover that there's too much of a problem, we have, we'll route a channel in the bottom of the lid and put in some um, thin neoprene automotive... Uh, vacuum tube it's, it's they make it in six different sizes it'll fit in there and that will that will seal but right now it's not a problem and uh, in a minute here I'm going to talk about the plumbing and that kind of stuff in there well yeah well, well actually we want to shift over to, to the inside yeah get some shots on that I'm going to talk a little bit about the plumbing system uh, we went really really uh, as inexpensively as possible with materials that some of which are borrowed from the RV industry um, basically, what we have is the urine diversion. Is it was an important part of this whole this whole idea. In commercial systems, the urine diverter is usually a small funnel or funnel-like cup that fits in front of the seat, below below the seat, but in front of the in front of the bowl, and that's a, a specific um, urine diversion, you know, capturing device. And then the rest of the toilet is a, is like a conventional seat. Um, so that that is. That flows into a separate container, and the same here. We have a um, a uh, tractor supply utility funnel. It basically is as close as we could get, uh, cleanable, sturdy, um, large enough uh, that takes care of that, and that goes into a a uh, bucket below with a sealed um, nozzle. So you don't want you don't want uh, insects or odors to come out of that and the on the other there's three buckets in there on the other side of the under the cabinet there which I've left the front off so you can see what's in there on the other side of the cabinet there's the water supply and that's fresh water supply not not potable not you know drinkable I mean we, we put drinkable water in it but it's not meant for drinking uh, and this I don't know if people can see me in here but this is the um, it's a it's a hand pump. We did not we did not want to make it an electric pump because people might leave it on. Uh, we didn't want to encourage a lot of water use, so people tend to use less water when they actually have to work a little bit for it. So it's just a little RV pump, a twenty four dollar uh, pumping system, and it just sucks its supply from a five gallon bucket down here. And this is a three dollar bowl stainless steel bowl I got from the Habitat uh, and put in a conventional one and a quarter inch drain. Just drill the hole and put the drain in. The drain goes down. There's a T in the drain going down. And you can see this when, we, when you get in here. The water, there's a, and then there's a valve below that. So we have a choice, a diversion valve. So if the valve is open, the water, any water that you put and wash your hands with, a little bit of soap in it, will go directly into the, into the uh, catchment basin for the sink. If you turn the valve off, any soapy water will, will not go there. It'll make a, make a left turn and help flush out the urinal drain tube to get the odors out. And that, will, and that water and urine will go, will, is stored in the, in the extreme left-hand bucket. Um, ideally, I would like a larger container for that because that's going to fill up quicker. But the, we can control how quickly that fills up with the valve. If I think it's getting filled, I'll shut that off. Yeah. Forgive me, but the funnel looks gender specific. It is, and that's that's a, that's an issue. That's a real that is a real issue. Um, the well, first of all, I guess what in in the real world, urine is going to get is going to find its way into the into the toilet seat, past the toilet seat. Ma mainly, that's that's for the male component. That that there. Um, because that's a lot of, um, you know, that's going to be a lot of just the one-time use and, and that's that. And that is, in this system, there's going to be a fair amount of attention paid to emptying that bucket on it. But it does have a lid. It does have a, you pull the plug and there's a cap that goes on there. So that's a sealed system. 
even in the, even in the urine diversion commercial thing, it's it's way up way up in the front. I mean, it's not that easy to to use. I mean, you know, so yeah. Won't there be a lot of management required for yes. the valves? Yes. And, and this during one, a busy event, people coming and going all the well, time. Well, that's what in an event and here, it's not going to be an issue. Uh -huh. I mean, because people will be trained to you know deal with it. At an event, yes, it will have to be somebody because we'll be we'll be it'll. You know, I, I would assume it would be near us where we will have our, t our booth or whatever, so we'll, we'll be dealing with that. We're not going to just park it and leave it, you know. Um, the other option is that these are not all, uh, these are just an economical solution. You, w we can purchase and may, may well purchase more commercially available totes of larger, taller and larger volume that are more um, containerized so we can, we can fit three really tightly square ones right next to each other and we could f probably hold twice as much uh, liquids. So that's, um, you know, this, main, this, this part was mainly to, um, to address the fact of, of as much recycling and low cost implementation because, you know, most composting toilets, I mean the toilet itself is not, doesn't have a hand washing station, doesn't have any of that stuff. This is just a thought in case we went someplace where we needed that. Yeah, I would throw in the, the Again, the, the, the balance of priorities is we're building this. One of the things we talked about at length, and I'm still an advocate for, and we're we, I think we're going to get to it, is a much larger tank and an easier way to just hit a valve so it drains to the outside to that tank, especially for the urine diversion. And we went back and forth on it, and it was like, well, everybody can get five-gallon buckets. But you start custom ordering or finding special tanks, and it's designed only for this, it really, I think, gives the wrong idea that, well, it has to be this way. The difference between going to an event, you know, the beer garden party Mexican fiesta thing, where you got people lined up waiting to use it, is a completely, almost completely different set of parameters from just on the farm or a family or a handful of people. So that the question on maintenance is totally valid. But this design, especially on the trailer, coming back to the events and hauling it around, lends itself to having other tanks that you can easily just set it, set next to them, underneath them, have more capacity, and be able to deal with this in a lot more, a, a less energy uh, intensive way in terms of the, the, the human input going into it. So it's kind of that balance there. And then there's the space consideration too. I mean, how much space can you fit in? You know, how many five gallon bucket, you know, a bigger tank. So, uh, it's easy to deal with if you have the room, and especially if it's not going to move too far in terms of the events and all that. You can make this happen. Like I said, bigger tanks in the back to get the, the solid waste and human ore out, larger tanks to hold the pee, a couple of bigger tanks for more water, but it's a matter of size. So how do we balance that out to do it? So. Um, and the uh, toilets themselves are, you know, strategically the holes are cut strategically over the bucket so we got the best placement for everything right you know it's not too far forward and it's not too far back and the lids still stay on the not the toilet seat lid but the uh, the container lids still stay open um, the whole time until you're ready to take it out and then the toilet seat will stay up once it's lifted it, it's been set to stay up but you know, you can look in, you know, it's not, obviously not enough room for everybody to come in at once, but you can look in and see pretty much how it, you know, how it looks. Um, you know, cleaning is another issue. I mean, that's basically, um, you know, at some point it's going to get, it's going to get, you know, like messy. I mean, it's not just, everything's not always so straightforward. So, um, again, the gloves, the, um, you know, maybe some peroxide, uh, try to avoid the use of bleach, certainly will kill the pathogens, but we, just around here, we try to avoid the use of um, sodium hypochlorite, you know, it's, it's basically peroxide is a much better agent for that because it, it does dissipate and it's still, you know, still a good cleaner, good disinfectant. Um, but, um, you know, I, I uh, would like, you know, everybody to come in here and just take a look in here. The screens are not in, but we already discussed that the screen is rised up. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a um, weatherproof lath screen they use for masonry work when you put, uh, on block walls, you, when you're laying bricks or whatever onto a onto a block surface, they have a little lath, expanded wire lath, which is back there. You can see it. Um, very um, weatherproof. 
So that will sit up about two inches from the base and the, edge and the corners folded down, front and back, and it just will sit in there, standing a little above, and uh, that'll allow the liquids to stay at the bottom and still allow airflow so everything's not completely down to the ground and there's no air allowed underneath. This is actually picking up the solid materials. The air will be allowed underneath. That'll help immensely. Um, that, if there was issues, some people cut um, pieces of cheap PVC pipe to put under the screen so that that pipe can be disposed of, not, not you know, on a too regular basis because you don't really want to just go through, you know, plastic pipe, but it, it's not expensive. Um, it's not compostable either, so, but it's, you can clean that too and you just reuse it. It doesn't disintegrate. Um, the, um, you know, the seats and the, the, the actual commode parts over here and that you can look at the plumbing under here. Um, I guess we can talk a little bit about the solar, the solar system too. Um, again, that was, that was um, a um, decision made for when there's a high amount of traffic. Uh, I think I already sort of went through that. We have basically a 95 watt solar panel, which is very small by, not incredibly small, but, uh, but on the lower end of, of uh, output for a PV system these days. 12 volt system, very simple, two golf cart, two deep cycle, six volt golf cart batteries that are wired in series so that six and six equals 12 volts. Um, a, um, a breaker box like, a, like you'd have in the house with, the, with, with DC direct current breakers, which actually are special breakers that re, uh, direct current creates more spark or more arc than alternating current like we have in the house. So they have to be specially made. Um, so that's in there, and, and the beauty of the whole thing is a, a, a battery uh, controller, a controller, a charge controller that protects the batteries and manages the system. The batteries can't be overcharged, and this particular one is um, a maximum um, PowerPoint tracker, MPPT. The, it's, it's a step up above from the old, what they call the pulse width modulation, which is an older way of, of managing the system. This is a very high-tech but not, it used to be fairly expensive. These, these are not anymore. They're, they're pretty common now. It measures the amperage and the voltage as, things, as the sun goes behind a cloud or the sun. Now it's not putting out much power because we're not in the window because that's getting through trees now. That will manage as the voltage drops, it adjusts the amperage. Um, and it was not intended to be a, a class on solar, but what that does is it extends the life of the batteries because it doesn't... Um, it doesn't waste any energy. It, 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 every, in milliseconds, every very, very quick times, it's measuring, analyzing what the sun's giving it, what the demand is at the moment, and then it's balancing those at, to the best of its ability until the sun goes away, and then it just, you know, it'll happen again uh, tomorrow. Um, the batteries are, I think as Ned said, they're there's not enough draw on this system. It's very low amperage. That little muffin fan is very, very low draw. Um, what, 1.2 amps, maybe something like that? If that one amp is very, very little. Yeah, it's it's just it's fractional. The other fan is more, but the other fan is only intermittent. It's a bilge fan for a marine application. So, um, in a gasoline-powered uh, boat, uh, you have to blow out the engine compartment before you start the engine because if the fumes were gathering in there and you started the engine, the spark would, may kick it off and there's been explosions, so it's required that you, it's a non-sparking bilge fan that just blows out uh, through a tube. So that's what that is. And the only other thing in here is a light, a very, a very low LED light, very low consumptive light. So this, these batteries will last probably, if I took that panel off and put it somewhere else, it would probably last a month without, without having to recharge under the use that it was designed for. So, you know, that's a, it's a very simple system, um, not expensive, not particularly expensive, applicable to a lot, like this could work to light a garden shed or to do um, outdoor lighting or whatever you wanted to do in a, on a smaller scale. So charge it's not, your cell phone. Charge your cell phone. That's many times the hot over. thing. Yeah. yeah. Many times over. It, uh, can I, can I, yeah. well, I'm thinking about it, I want to add uh, just a hint or a tip here on the cleaning part of it, like pulling out the buckets, the coolers, and, and whatever system you end up with. Um, I found that uh, very low cost, highly effective. 
Get yourself one of those two or three gar uh, gallon garden sprayers you can pump up to pressurize and use that because a lot of the, your compost pile, you may, but it, it, there's no water there. How do you clean it? What do you do? Well, you can pump these little guys up and just spray it down because you get pretty good pressure. I mean, the more you spend on it, the better, the higher pressure and the better you're going to get. But I've got one that was $14 at Ace, I think. And it's still it's a year or two now, and it's still working away. I Spring for a little bit more. It's cheap, and I'm amazed it hasn't fallen apart, considering I use it. Uh, but it's really handy. So a gallon or two of water under pressure like that, and you just carry it along, spread it, and just spray it from a distance. You don't want to get in there. You know, you're wearing your gloves, but nobody really wants to get in there and scrape this stuff clean. Um, oh, and the other part of that was that, it, it, it's our, our huge diversion in opinion in fact here. The, soda, the hydrogen peroxide and these other organic cleaners are really better in terms of if you're going pure organic, I know you're talking about that and you know, absolutely a purist about it. But 30 years into this, um, a little bit of sodium hydroxide, hydro bleach, let's go goes does wonders if you can just barely smell it in the water you got enough in there it's cheap it goes a long way it dead meat kills everything that it comes in contact with it's obviously great for cleaning the plastic and so forth off and uh and not a lot i'm not saying go wild with it but just a, a couple of literally capfuls in a gallons of water when you spray just a couple of capfuls a little blast in there will clean it off and I have never seen any negative impact on the human or compost pile that I've got in terms of oh it's going to kill it or it won't hurt it. it breaks down over time so it's not ultimately pure but it's really cheap it absolutely does the job and so Use either one, they'll work. But I, if you can just smell the hint of the bleach in the air, you know you're doing it right. <laughs> yes, sir. What about uh, using some kind of liner for like the batch compartment, like out of Earth Haven, they'll line their five gallon buckets like with wax paper or something like that, like using a paper bag or something, just to assist with the cleaning. Of well, the batch. Uh, um, y yes, actually, that's a good idea. I'm, I'm t what I'm toying with with this because it'll just about fit is lining it with just a brown paper bag for the bottom layer only to hold in some of the, the either the pine litter or straw, whatever we use, just to get that going. Um, but you still it, it, it makes it easier, but you still have to do exactly the same thing, which is clean the whole thing out. So it, it, the bigger pro I mean, aligning is going to help. If it's paper, you can put it right in the compost pile, so that's totally fine. And the, the water with the bleach in it and a regular brush has been the best thing I found over the years. So you'll have less of it if you got a liner, so that's a good idea. Uh, the, the sprayer, the garden sprayer, you know, the pressure sprayer thing, it knock, almost all the time completely knocks it off. And remember, you're not, you're not cleaning it. <laughs> Bear with me. You're not cleaning it so you can eat off the surface. It's gonna, you're going to get browned in the, on the plastic in most of these containers in a while. As long as it looks clean and you see it's going and you smell the bleach, you're, you're only going to be dumping in, taking a dumping in it again. So you want to kill the bacteria and the pathogens, not worry about it being super, super clean. Yes, sir. Roughly with the solar and all, how much you got in that thing? The solar system was um, approximately 530 bucks, I believe. Now that... I qualify that we could we could have bought we could have yeah, spent. I, I mean the, the bill. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, the, the, you know, just little things. We could have bought that controller. I could have cut that price in half by buying the cheaper one. You know that kind of thing. So that's that. The whole thing here, probably, the way it stands. Um, the trailer was a thousand dollars of it. I, I think it was twenty five hundred twenty. A little over twenty five hundred, and the trailer is a thousand of that. If you use. Um, uh, sawmill access wood, uh, green lumber, and uh, rough cut and stuff, you can cut that down even more. Um, you know, and, and also most of the hardware is new and that can be alleviated by just picking up stuff, you know, from the habitat or whatever. So, you know, there's that. Yeah, and thank you for the question because that was a good one. It was about a $2,500 budget to, to do yeah. the whole thing. And so right away, if you're not planning to drive around with it, you're down a thousand bucks already. 
and we literally built the entire building to put the buckets into. So if you've already got a room, you've got an area, you, you're working on, the, say, the first floor and you're going to run down to composting in the basement, you've got areas, you're building the thing anyways, the, the actual amount of investment in terms of making the composting part work, let's, let's say you've already got power and so on, I mean, you can be down to a couple hundred bucks. It really does. You, you got to make a box and put the lids on it and make sure it doesn't oh, leak. I wouldn't go down that low. I've been to Lowe's enough. You don't get out of that. <laughs> well, it, well, I mean, I don't, we don't have well, the breakdown, but I mean, that includes buying all new lumber for them. Yeah, right, I can tell you the, the buckets. And, the buckets are twenty four. The, the the Coleman things were twenty four ninety five each, each one. Um, the fan was twenty four dollars. The big fan. The little fan is uh, seven something at uh, at Radio Shack. Um, but you're right about lumber. I mean, about lumber, yeah, you can, you can, but if you really don't have to put a building around it, you know. Yeah, and it, I mean, it adds up like that, but it, again, it, all these things, I mean, that's the roof, the flashing, the, the, the everything they hit you for, how much for that box of screws, you know, all that, and it's still, it, everything on the thing, high done with the, with the solar, which is entirely true, 1500 so you know, I mean, that's not cheap, but you can easily tighten that up and get that cost down there and balance against what it's going to cost for a lot of other things. So I guess where I'm coming from with this is um, we're designing for a range of different things as well as educational. And I mean, not counting the trailer because they could use that for others. You know, how do we demonstrate it? We start. Is it going to stay in one place? Is it going somewhere else? Can we teach with it? Can we work with it? Can the interns use it? All this, all these, so he's like, yeah, just build your own little shed and then put it all into it, which not everybody's going to have to do. So uh, nothing is free in life, but some, are, some things are more affordable than others, that's all. You had mentioned black soldier fly. How does that work into all this? The fly larva, the flies that don't bite, they do not bite, they don't bother humans, but the fly larva, um, is chicken feed, make an excellent chicken feed, poultry and chicken feed, and the fly, and, and the other benefit is that it, it digests um, waste material very, very efficiently. So I think he, what his interest was maybe in introducing, instead of trying to keep the flies out, introducing the soldier fly and seeing how that completes the cycle, because I'm, since they are not interested in human activity, they would not be, and this is just conjecture on my part, but I, I, I guess what he's trying to figure out is that they would not be getting into the composting material and then flying onto your plate. I mean, they have, they have a very short uh, span, and they have an interest in going from A to B, and you know, that's basically how they, how they work. But uh, when, when, I guess, I think when he comes out, maybe you could ask him directly about it. They can break down the waste much faster. Yeah, exactly. Even faster than microbes. We have a big, long video on the website if you want to watch it with Carl Wachowski. He's wonderful. So maybe it's <clears throat> after you take the bucket out of the shed here and put it wherever, then you introduce the larva. Well, I, I do know that would be that would be fine. You know, the, my my question again would be vectors. I mean, is it yeah. absolutely guaranteed that those flies will not do their thing and then fly to your picnic table? But you know, I don't I, I don't think there's anything in the human factor that they really are interested in because they have a very it's almost like a bee. I mean, it has a very dedicated you know, job, and they, and they stick to it. Um, uh, something else came to mind with the... Uh, oh, yeah, I was talking to somebody in Buncombe County last week that, uh, that has found the BSF, the soldier flies, in his composting toilet. They're, they're all in there, and the, and the material just, just was... As soon as they were introduced, it was gone. I mean, it was, it was, deep, it was down. So, um, you know, apparently they are interested. Are there any other questions? Can yeah. You, can you talk about some of the best practices for the compost? You Either way. Well, I, I guess taking it step by step, I'll come back to the uh, sanitation aspect of getting it to the pile. I know you have to, you know, wear your gloves and the spray and all that. All right. So yeah, once the once the human ore has composted, and you're and it, you got given your year on it, and it's all done and it's all looking good, it's just like regular compost. In terms of visual, uh, odors, texture, the whole thing. Uh, and you just apply it to the trees. 
to the shrubs, to the non-root crop vegetables for that extra margin of safety and just use it the same way. Once, once it's clean, once it's dead, the pathogens are gone, it's just compost. There's really, except for those vectors, that, that comes back to the, the black soldier flies, just those vectors, those problems with pathogens that are transmitted between human to human and so forth, that's where the issue is. Once you kill them, it's just compost. So you can do, you, you can do, if we're on film, I won't tell you, don't use it on root crops, don't use it on the veggies, you know, just use it for ornamentals and shrubs and trees and woodies and all that. Just dump it out. I mean, when it gets to that point, you can just do it with your bare hands. Just throw it right out. It's clean. It's good to go. So it just, it, it, it all comes back to that health sanitation aspect of, of this whole process. And once it's done, it's black, it's crumbly, it's delightful, it's ready to go. And, and you, depending on what materials go into the compost and, and making it, you can't tell the difference between the human or compost and anything else out of the garden, except I waited a year for that one. And I got this one in 45 days, but the end result is the same thing. And, and you're just as long as you have those right carbon, nitrogen, the, you know, the leaves and the sawdust and all that good stuff that you're putting in to keep it going, it's the same deal. For two different reasons. It's the same, same process, the same thing, and like I said, time is the extra factor in this. In the agricultural compost pile, when you're trying to crank it out for the garden to use it, you want it to go fast. You want this process to go through. So all those things, you put the temperature, the oxygen, moisture, the balance, everything together, boom, it's gonna go do it. And you get compost fast. Well, with human or composting, you wanna kill the pathogens. So you do all the same thing. It'll take off, it'll do it, but you give it longer to completely knock out those pathogens. So yeah, it's essentially the same process, but time is different. Give it more time. So I've got a question. Yeah. <clears throat> you wanted the 30 to one ratio. Yep. So, in this system right here, are you going to have a bucket of the, the pine sawdust and then you're going to have a scoop there? And it's One scoop gonna... per poop. Okay. Yeah. So, how big is the scoop? Uh, like a cup or a pint? Uh, or... About a, a three quarters of a cup. Oddly enough, <laughs> for people who study this stuff, uh, <laughs> about three quarters of a cup is usually just about right and i'm talking about the the forest pine of these right. lately because it, uh, it'll flop up right oh yeah yeah and and when you, you make your contribution to the revolution there and three quarters of a cup is it, maybe even a little less is just enough to just especially with the pine just enough to cover it because it will puff and it'll draw it in now if you're <clears> going to use sawdust it's more like maybe a cup and a half because it's okay. thinner because you wanted to pull it in um but it's in that range, and quite frankly, when we're looking at it in this batch arrangement, in this particular, these coolers, what we're talking about right here, that one scoop or so, you want to absorb the moisture and you want to deal with odors because it's going back out to get more carbon when it goes to the compost pile outside. So, so you don't have to worry about 30 to 1 in a batch system. It's when you get to that final compost pile where that's really critical. So when you have this system going, when you start with a, a new empty bin mm -hmm. and you put the screen down there, then do you put like a half inch layer of sawdust on top of it? Uh, well, uh, well, probably by a, a sprinkle. It, you don't have to. I like to do it because it gets you off to a good start, and you don't have. It doesn't stick to as much stuff. It seems like when you the other dump tanks. it, it's going to pull right out. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, I, I think I'm going to come around the block to answer that. When you start, the, when I start the outdoor like four by four pallets in a big old right. outdoor compost, I put in a whole bale of hay. Right. And so for a whole, I mean, it goes down fast. So it provides a dead meat layer, you know, for all the stuff to go on plus air and everything going. On. And in in the indoor uh, sunmar that I've got, once it's all cleaned out, I go in and pour in probably two or three cups worth. Or the, lately, I've been using the pine pellets or maybe four or five of the sawdust just for that first layer so it's not going raw into something flat right. and then start adding from there. So in this, um, we'll see. But yeah, uh, the, the, I like the idea of the paper bag just to contain this initially to get it going. Then once it starts bulking up, it doesn't go very far. Okay. And that the, the paper bag on the screen would be kind of like the liner. We, we from, uh, or the, you know, Same kind of an idea with that. 
yes, it'll. I'm not worried about cleaning it as much. As, well, I don't want to do that either. But you know, I'm not worried about cleaning it so much as making sure the air is getting around it. So I think that paper is going to be permeable enough with the gap around the side, and then a little bit of the uh, uh, whatever you use, straw, hay, whatever. You know. So with this uh, combination of materials, when you go to dump it, it comes out pretty easily. It's not like dumping a bucket of mud. Um, it, if it's if it's, it, it comes out easily, sometimes if it's too wet, too easily, mm -hmm. the, the, the sloppy right, mud. Right. But no, generally speaking, um, almost all the time over the years, because I've used a lot of systems where I have to lift it over the top and then carry buckets and other types, put it in paper bags and then throw it in and all that. Uh, generally, almost everything will come out right away. It just a, a sawdust. If you do it even close to right, almost everything comes out right away, and then you're left with a a scum, whatever, a layer all around. But it's very light. It's not like it's it's all you know. So that's where the sprayer comes in. And that that first the first spray around, you're gonna look down and go, but, it but it's not a lot of water, and it'll rinse almost all of it off right away. Okay. Cool. And so it's not a bit. It's, it's very rarely a bit. Now if you if it's filling up with urine. And it's wet. Then you're going to have a sloppy mess, and it's it's, it's going to be a little so hard. So if we were using this system right here at, in North Dakota at mm -hmm. the camp there, how would you approach it? I know that this wasn't designed for that, but you you know you're going to have a lot of people using it. So you'd have the pine business there, and then you'd have a <coughs> dump station. Well, uh, hopefully our team <laughs> we're going to work, we're going to come up with a plan. Uh, well, if we would uh, if I was in charge and I was doing it, I would build a row of benches very similar to what Richard and I built right now, over a larger area than all of it being open. The same kind of some kind of a fan assembly for that whole open area, but a much bigger volume back there, so that when the doors in the back open up to, to service it, you could be able to literally rake the, and use uh, straw, okay. and literally rake it back from underneath the drop points. So to let it build up before you got to scoop, shovel it out, scoop it, we'll get that. You know, so you have a row of it, and then as you pull it out, then you you can still throw in the straw, hay, whatever from the backside. Now, <clears throat> I keep saying straw because out there it's cattle country. You know, right. you got straw. This sweet. Yeah. I've been in conversation with a number of people. They're looking at using straw bale construction for uh, insulation and stuff through the winter. So that it's, it's relatively it's easily accessible and it's cheap. Rel you know, all things considered. So, um, to import pine or anything else, it's like, nah, 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 nah. you already got bales, of yes, and I already know it's, it's one of the best in terms of the air. Like Richard was saying about the loft and all that, it's great. So with that, you can have as long a row as you want with as deep as an area, which, you know, it is, I mean, it's still, it's still human or it's still composting and nobody wants to do it, but it's nice, it's easy, it's not a big deal. And you can have literally hundreds, thousands of people using these things with one or two people doing the maintenance on it, keeping an eye on it, you're fine. And once a week, once every couple of, I mean, you know, again, it's, uh, what's the scale to it, you go out there with shovels, throw it in the bucket, throw it in the, you know, whatever, and then move it to some final place where it will sit and compost. Right. And you get that mix just about right, leave it out. You, just, you don't have to get excited about it. Because it will compost, it will break down, and you know, and you're not digging. I mean, it, I don't know. You, you, you don't want to do a pit latrine, an outhouse, just a hole in the ground. It's like no, 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 no. That's definitely you know, people throwing lime and all this other stuff to odors and all that. And when it's finally done, well, we'll just cover it over and we'll move it and dig another hole. Well, again, if you're one person on a thousand acres, well, cool. You know, it'll, you'll never find where you left it. But when you start getting populations and densities, it is totally a bogus way to do it. That really migrates through the ground, uh, a lot of materials. For, according to the EPA, I mean, it, it still breaks down. But What's it, the minimum safe distance to a stream that you should put human compost? Excuse me if I broke in, you can no, answer no, later. No, 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 I don't, I don't, uh, Richard, this, this uh, minimum required distance to a stream for for human or composting or actually using it, well, because because I don't think it's going to be any. It's a set. 
the septic tank and any field. and any use septic, septic field. field and any use any deposit of any material like when you're camping is a hundred feet away from a running stream but you know um, just that's just a thing. yeah yeah that, that's how I, I've seen that number somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's just a really fun. seems like 75 to 100. I don't, I don't know. I'll go with 100. 100. Are you yeah. Talk about the barrel system at all. First thing, 55 gallon barrels. Once it's full, it's a tough to move those puppies around. So there's a logistical issue. <clears throat> but if you seal them off, it's going to go anaerobic. So if it's sealed off with no oxygen, it's going to go anaerobic. Now, the, I've seen variations of that where they do that on purpose to be able to harvest the methane and the natural gas off it. <clears throat> but that process is not the same as composting and making the human work. Um, and in the, I'm not aware of any aerobic, I'm trying to think right off the head, the, the barrel systems where you just cap them off and let them sit that's going to do anybody any good. It'll go anaerobic, and that, that may actually burst the thing apart and end up gas pressure well, in it. I, I um, have the impression that there were some, you know, some animals, I don't know, just, you know, kind of around the, the punches from the top of it. Yeah. yeah, but I would see that could be a problem yeah. with flies. Yeah. I mean, unless yeah. it was screens. Right. Um, and, you know, when you have a 55-gallon a drum is, you know, yay high, maybe that top layer would get, you know, some aerobic action, but, you know, at the very bottom, Unless there's, I'm, I'm just not familiar with exactly the system you're talking about. That there could be um, pipes with holes drilled in them, uh, the way they extract methane from landfills, so and that could let air in. I mean, something like that. I'm, I'm sort of see the design. And I, I had that. I, I, I think yeah. I've seen the one. The, the fellow at Midwest. If if it's a 55 gallon, I just thought of the barrel metal and sealed, and now is there. But somebody. Either they're making them or they're commercially available as composters for the garden, but they've got the, the tube down the middle that, 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 that hits something in the bottom to keep it up something in the air, perforated the whole way with the screen, and then it's open at the top so that the air does move in and come up. I'm trying to the fellow that. I can't remember his name, but I, I met him. Oh, yeah, they were. So, but that would be an aerobic composter that just happens to be in a 55-gallon barrel because it had the, the uh, provision for air getting at the bottom, a perforated tube going up through the middle, but it was, but it was not sealed off. I mean, it was still open to the air uh, at the top. I can see that system working with garden compost much better yeah. than it would work with human yeah. Oh, I would think we work with both, but again, you're going to make sure that air is getting through there. What if you and you get the leakage out the bottom issue? That's another thing. If you're just using the barrels, uh, uh, well, if you do, you have a reference for that or, or a source? I'd love to look into it more. Well, I've I, seen I, some, I, some YouTube videos about people doing that, and we used um, a composting toilet in Oregon that was, you know, you had to step up that had straw bales and so you were you were quite elevated and they told me I didn't see how the actual composting process worked but they told us that that's what we were you know depositing into was a 55 gallon drum and I was led to believe that you know they just kept, kept it in that drum to finish its composting cycle and over you, uh, for a year's I time. Could, yeah, it was surrounded by hay bales for insulation so it was warm and then it was aerated in this manner that he just talked about with the central tube, pipes, and at the bottom maybe maybe a series of pipes that radiate out, maybe eight or so, so that the air would, you know, would would sort of go like that. Then I could see maybe, I'm not, I'm not sure how well it would work in the, you know, uh, percentage of efficiency, but at least it would be a good start towards working, you know. And that, that may be what you're talking about. I used to do a system like that, and um, I will say that we do five-gallon buckets now, and it's a, it's a lot of mass to deal with, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, like, you can do it on a tractor, but if you have any hills or anything, and you need to put it somewhere for a year, and, you know, we found it to be such a pain in the butt mm. that we finally, like, built a compost and dumped all of it in in an appropriate way so that it would just 
get on with it because it's so much mass mm -hmm. and it's so heavy and so hard and nobody wants to get in there and clean those barrels, you know, it was just crazy. Mm -hmm. So we found it simpler to just constantly designate five gallon buckets and, and, even, and it's a little bit more regular maintenance, but it's very doable. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm not one to, I don't, I'm not saying this because I want to hear myself talk, but I feel like it's really valuable information. Um, you know, if you think of those, the mobile, and I, I had talked to Ned about this before now, but the, uh, the trash cans that have the wheels on them, the big bins, um, if back here, one of those were to slide in. And then the Bugachi is a uh, anaerobic bacterium. Anaerobic. Right. And the pH, um, you know, it's, it's, it's called Bugacci composting, but it's more fermentation. Mm -hmm. And the uh, methane producing microbes can't live in that environment. So it doesn't produce methane gas yeah. the, when you ferment like that. And so the Bugacci, which is essentially EM1, it's um, effective micro, I, I forget what EM stands for, but uh, basically when it's added to, and it's, you know, Bugacci is the Japanese have taken like bran and they add the EM to it. And so it's sprinkled in with sawdust as you're filling up that big green trash can. When it's about 80% uh, full, you pull it out and you just let it sit for like two years so you can add a new one in. So there's actually no like touching of it and dumping of it. It basically sits and obviously at the bottom you put a couple bricks with a screen so that you can, when you first put it together, you add one of those like rain barrel kind of, yeah, exactly. So then you can set it up like that, but the idea is you just have a permanent place and it's unlimited scalability. You just keep buying new trash cans. So that was the idea that I've been kind of toying with and coming up with some different. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert, I mean, I haven't done it. Yeah, no, I understand. That's something to look into for sure. I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with that. Um, we, the reason, I mean, just speaking of the containers now, we initially started with, with something almost of that size, but it's just way too tall. I mean, you don't really want to climb up to an elevated height if you can, you know, and it's something like there. Well, this you would cut the base off? Yeah. And so, like, I'm looking at trailers that don't have the axle as far so that you can just basically, you know, swing the doors open, walk in, right. and then walk it out. Right. Is that one year of fermentation? Is that what you said? Well, according to what I've researched, six months is sufficient. And that's, and that's to kill the pathogens? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, so this stuff, uh, again, like the Bugacci is used, um, it's, it's a very popular thing, and they'll add meat into it. I mean, literally, there's no smell, it's very effective, and it's been used for a very, very long time. So it's not like something that just came you know, somebody developed. Uh, is it uh, salty? And what I'm thinking is the well, most, the supposedly the fer fermentation uh, process, it's a sour smell. So it doesn't produce like, um, so there's like the putrid, you know, I forget what that's called, but basically whatever that bacteria is that smells really funky, uh, that doesn't survive this environment. So this is just super acidic. Right. Yeah, we had a, we had a, uh, fellow come by yesterday just uh, just looking at the system while we were working on it and he said have you heard of and I'm sure he said and I hadn't I, he said EM something and I'm and, and then he, he I was doing something else so I wasn't listening to the rest of the conversation so but apparently he's you know the way he was talking it was something we were we were just discovering at this point so maybe that's you know the same thing huh. yeah I never thought about fermentation um, but that's a whole different thing. And, and when the, one last question, so when, when the, 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 the butchery, whatever, it's all done, it goes right back into the garden? It goes back into the soil? It's, it's compost at that point, but supposedly a lot of these folks would actually like bury it. So they dig holes, I think is how it was used. Yeah, you know, the, to uh, me, the, the, again, the central point around it, the, the, I keep bringing it back, is that health and sanitation and getting away from the water and all these other, but to kill the pathogens and make it safe. So uh, we know that aerobic <coughs> decomposition and, and so forth and that is going to do the job, but we can ferment it and there's another way to do it. Who knows? I, I'm, I'm all for it. You know, because I've heard of it, but that's fascinating. If that's, and especially if you can be back into, complete that cycle, get it back into the soil, get it back into the ground, 
and, and bring that all that whole thing together. Not just kill the pathogens, but be able to use it afterward. And that's why, I'm, for less bins, for that one step of throwing it onto the pile, then you do nothing about it for a year. So you, so yes, you got that step in there. Now, does the pile have to be flipped like a normal compost pile? No, it's the beauty of it. You got you got the temperature, oxygen, moisture, the balance, everything in there and you're giving it the time, there's, you don't have to do that. In fact, if you do flip it, you may, you may stop the cycle and actually slow everything down because you're going to introduce air, but you're also going to introduce cold air, yeah. and you're going to take that heat and dissipate it, um, and it's going to have to build all back up again. And Why would it be different than like your forced air compost system? You know what I mean? Like in terms of adding oxygen. Most yeah, well, that, that's that is the case. I mean, people are encouraged to, to turn their compost, and we got and we have air going into that one up there. The humidor compost, why is that there? The pathogens and the thermophilic bacteria. Yeah, the thermophilic bacteria are well. It's the thermophilic bacteria are the ones that work at the highest temperature. So when you introduce even moderately cool air, they 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 can't work anymore. And they're the ones that remember the chart I drew with the with the sure. one corner, they're the ones, only the thermophilic bacteria are the ones that break stuff down really quickly. So once you disturb them, you're down into the mesophilic and that takes, you know, a long time. Right, exactly, the core stays hot, yeah, exactly. But then when it, well, go ahead, it, break, it breaks, it, it contracts. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it, gosh, it's almost worth having some kind of a video dynamic. Yes, the, the, the middle, it starts out, the, the core in the middle goes in critical mass, and that'll hit 167, whatever, and start doing it. And that's where the bulk of the action goes. But yes, the perimeter is not going to reach that temperature just from heat loss coming off from the sides. But that still gets most of it going, and bring it back into what you're asking about the other pile, um, you're giving it a year to do its thing, and the mesophilic bacteria is also going to kill these pathogens. It just takes longer. And when you're looking at comparing garden compost to humanure <clears throat> killing pathogens in there, most of the work in the garden compost is really in the mesophilic range. It doesn't get that hot in there most of the time. And having a mechanism turning it for getting oxygen in there does, it just kills it, well, it doesn't kill it, but it slows down the thermophilic but make sure you've got oxygen all the way through for the mesophilic range to continue working so you don't have dead spots <coughs> that aren't getting the air that's in there. But given it the, the time, you get the bulk, and it, the, maybe Joe had the chart, I've seen it. The bulk of it, if you, if you get that pile out there, it's actually an ongoing series, so it's really hard to, to visualize, but if you, pour it, if you put it all out at once, you get that hot core that goes, it gets most of it, and then as it dies down and cools off, the mesophilic takes from there. So you've actually killed almost everything in the first month or two, and the slower-acting bacteria get the rest of it by the time it's all over. And when you're adding it, and that's part of why is is you, it, like like we do with it, get the buckets or whatever, and you go out once a week or once a month, and you dump the buckets onto the composting pile, and it's always doing it's doing its thing. If you say, well, I want to use this in the garden, once it's full, you get to play, okay, we're not adding any more into this pile for one year before we use it and start a next pile. And then you just build it up. And then that one year, you'll have a little bit of thermophilic bacteria action going on in there and the mesophilic, and it's a slower process at that point. So that, it, I mean, if you could take it, it that's, I'm trying to put it in a, if you could take the entire pile of, of crap that you just pulled out and heat it to 165 and hold it for an hour solid totally through, you kill the pathogens. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't happen. It takes a time and it's in spots and bits and pieces. So, uh. I, I wanted to mention too, uh, not with humanure, but <clears throat> with composting, and people may have heard of this, but there is a, a system built by a French farmer in the south of France back in the 80s named Jean Pain. He took the and I've seen them, I mean, there have been people doing it, and we did it, I don't know if you remember, I remember, yeah, remember that, with, we took a, took a uh, four foot high and about a four foot round wire, a cage, you know, like uh, from, like uh, not hog wire, but more like a fencing, 
and then coiled black polyethylene tube in there. And then that pile worked, that was 162 degrees of water in there. And you would have to feed a little bit because that would you know, dissipate and then you put more on the outside. It would slow and it would, it would speed up and it would slow down. And, but you'd always have some supply of warmish water, anything from hot water, I mean fairly hot water, to, to warmish water depending on the season. But um, you know, once you start extracting heat, you can't have everything. I mean, if you start pulling heat out of that system, you're slowing down their activity. I think that was Larry Holler. Wasn't that Larry Holler? Holler, yeah. Can you see under a microscope? Can you determine that it's pathogen free? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the testing. Sure. Um, we, I mean, we wouldn't do it. We, we're, we'll send it out. Mm. But it, it's like a lot of testing. They, they're testing for markers, chemical components of the pathogens. So they'll be looking for trace. Uh, uh, just the trace signatures, I think, is the word. Of you know, each has a chem Each of these pathogens has a specific chemical in its makeup, and they can find it. So they don't have to fit. Well, all I'm getting is that they don't have to necessarily eyeball that particular organism to identify it, but you can find track it in terms of like antibodies type of a thing. We do. There's a lot of blood tests. But they don't actually look at the whole thing. They're just looking for markers for the whole thing, like hemoglobin and some of these other ones. So. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I want to qualify that. I'm not uh, qualified or otherwise experienced with actually doing that testing in terms of it. And that's kind of what I'm looking forward to out of this project with Living Web Farms. We'll be able to actually get more science behind this whole thing, specifically with the urine and so on. It, it goes there. So we know, I mean, I know that it works, it's been proven and all that. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's a magic. It works. You know, we know that part, but why? Well, now we're going to find out, you know, get some hardcore. And others are doing it. I mean, it, it is beginning to really get, in my view, the attention it should have scientifically and professionally. So, avoiding the plague is a good idea, <laughs> is my thought anyway. Uh, is there yeah. any, any particular questions people have? I mean, I, I had spent a little bit of time, I don't, I don't really want to spend too much on it if somebody's, if it's not applying to anybody, but, you know, the indoor systems, Really, it's a whole different animal. I mean, that's a warmer environment, and things happen on a different schedule. But um, beyond that, I didn't know if there was any any questions or they were not ready exact quite ready for the meal yet. But yeah. Um, how much does it shrink? Like, say, say a compost bin was about half the height of this um, structure, and it was full, and so you waited the year. Um, how f and it was full like to the top. How much, how much fertilizer would you have in the end? It, it shrinks a tremendous amount. Uh, I, I, I try to. I don't know exactly. It, it just keeps shrinking. It, it's been my experience with it, and I leave it in one place. And because it, it, I, I garden and small, all that, um, I haven't done. But at, it, if if it's full and you walk away and leave it for a year. Let's say a four by four box. I'm just going to set me on the pallet because I'm used to that. Um, just kind of top it off with the last bit of straw <clears throat> and come back in a year. Uh, it's going to be about half full. It's going to go down by about halfway, maybe a little bit more. Uh, it, it's 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 magic. I'm coming back to that again. I mean, year after year, I kept thinking, that, you know, I'm going to fill this up and I'll start another one, and it just keeps going down. And now the pallets collapsed on it. It's all going down. It's like a you know, black hole, and I haven't used I haven't used the human earth for it because it's right there, and it just keeps going down. I mean, the pines and the jacks, and all the other stuff in the woods are loving it. But so I mean, it's 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 so you, again, it comes back to what I said in the beginning. You just don't get that much out of it, volume wise, to in terms of oh, I'm doing this to make compost. There's a lot faster, easier, and quicker ways to do it. The way I built it, and others have, and I know this works. It's really slick. Take five pallets, put the first one on the ground, you're up off the ground that little bit, put the next four around it, strap them, wire them, tie them, nail them together, whatever, so you now have what amounts to a big crate. And I line the inside of mine, and I've built a couple of them with uh, the, the half inch mesh wire, just keep critters you know, from just tearing right into it, but you're still getting air going into there. 
and then just start throwing the bale of straw, the first one to get going, to layer the bottom, and just start dumping it in, and that's it. Dump it and go, dump it and go, dump it and go. <laughs> 14 years for the same box, dump it and go, and it's still working, so. I'm, I'm gonna, I gotta build another, that's why I'm thinking of building this thing with the cement blocks with air and vents and so forth through there, is it? I'm getting too old, every 14 years I gotta build another one of these things? I don't know about this. So, and as, again, as long as getting these components in there, I can't, right now I can't see any reason why it wouldn't work, then it would be permanent, and you don't have anything rotten out as far as the system goes, and still be able to have access, except for a little door, so. Uh, and it's and it, it's, it, it collapses, but <coughs> once it once it does collapse and hits the ground, everything's still going in the air. It, it's uh, and it's it's I, I can't take it out in the yard and I come back to it again. It's uh, why I like the straw so much. And it's it's August <clears throat> when it's hot and humid, and you got a big bucket. And it's like oh, you know, not quite totally covered. You dump it over there. You know what you just did. It's, oh man cover it with that much of that straw you, from here to there you walk away it's gone you go back and 10 minutes later barely tell anything is there whatsoever so what about leaves Pardon me? what about leaves are they too big and so they would stop the oxygen if they use leaves uh no leaves are, are actually a good source of carbon for it uh, and it's okay to use a big leaf you don't have to cut them well i Arguably, you could run it through a chipper or a mulcher thing, but no, leaves are, pfft. I mean, it, it, I guess, but it, I don't know, the bigger the leaves, the faster they seem to decompose. I got all those polonias or empress trees, whatever you call it, with those, you know, mm -hmm. beautiful leaves. That, when they come off, you got like 12 hours before they just <laughs> melt away on you. And in the oak, I've got a lot of oak leaves from where I am. And it, it varying, I mean, I, I raked it up and throw it into the compost pile every once in a while, I'll be short on the hay. And, just rake the area right around it, clean it up, throw it, just put it right in there and go away until I get, you know. So the biggest enemy in terms of going anaerobic in these piles is too much moisture and water. When it soaks, that's where you get a problem. But once your sides are up and you're open reasonably well, that almost goes away, unless you're in like probably, you know, I don't know, Washington, Oregon with nonstop rains, then you could have an issue. Or like I said, that depression, is in a few of those. Uh, and then from there, just 30 to 1. It's hard to, it's really hard to put in too many leaves and too much stuff. And even when you're waiting a year, small sticks, twigs, whatever, just throw it on there. So when that final compost, you get to it, you see, you might have a few chunks and a few sticks here and there. But. Uh, Probably a lot less, there's a lot more land in those days and a lot less people. And nobody so cared. it wasn't as much of an issue, I'm sure. Yeah, I, it, well, I kind of started with that in the talk. It, it lost in the mists of time and <laughs> hail, you know, what happened in the population density and all that. And, and like the article in Mountain Express, there's a bear compost in the woods. You know, if you've got, you've got all this area, it's not a problem. It's just in terms of plague, disease, and social and all that, it's not a problem to stop and squat kick a little couple of leaves over like the animals and walk on it. There's no, there's more or less nobody around. It's part of the story. You know? So what, I, I can't answer your question. I don't know what they did, but it's not that big of a deal. And a lot of it is nomadic. And then when you get into these, uh, I mean, I know that the, the from the archeological digs, there were specific uh, channels, uh, kind of toilets and irrigation where the Mayan, the Incan, uh, Aztec and so forth, it, so it's kind of the same culture, more or less. I, I know that's not exactly true. Mm -hmm. So there's been a yeah, but when you get to nomadic people, it's like, well, you know. But you also had a lot less pathogens because they weren't intermixing either. I right. mean, right. well, I mean, groups of people weren't intermixing. Yeah. Well, but I, I, that, that maybe there are less. I'm speculating here, so I'm not going to pretend. No. But less, certainly less variety in exotic well, okay. pathogens. Mm -hmm. But you just take some of the common things we deal with: E. coli and food poisoning, and, uh, and worms it, too, worms, worms and parasites, yeah. and all this kind of thing that that travel through the manure and so on. So that uh, <coughs> maybe not as bad as the black plague and all that, but you still, so. So, but again, it's that it, the, the population density problem where where you're going. So. Uh, 
Well, I will look into that too because I, I develop a interest. Well, everybody has, but uh, with the Standing Rock and, and these other issues, and wanted to, I hope, help out with that in terms of just composting human earth, seeing what they're doing. So I don't know what the what the history, the oral history, or the whatever were. I never asked, but I'm, I'll learn something new if I'm lucky at all. Any other questions? Uh, did you have something? You're, 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 you're. He was talking about uh, well, char, and, and that, that's another thing that I think we talk, you know, talk about loft and putting stuff on the top of the pile. Um, you know, I imagine biochar might not be a bad, a bad be fantastic. Lo it's lofting carbon, really. it's, uh, yeah. it's charcoal and it's aerated. And, your urine if you don't put it directly in your garden some does make it to the to the pile but the rule is pee outdoors and never always pee outdoors and never in the same place twice <laughs> and not in the garden yeah, so. now yeah. not everybody can do that obviously well, but if you had a urine system, urine system. well okay um, the, Take that urine and pour it onto the compost pile when you bring the solids out. And that you you can overdo it, and, and there's but most of the time, the solids, the extra carbon, whatever you're using onto the pile needs moisture. And you've got a lot of nitrogen. You got the, the, all these other factors. So pouring the urine over that uh, is the most common way of dealing with it right there. You know, Put it on there. Now that comes back to where that leachate and having drainage and not letting it get too wet and so on and so forth, so that it can go right onto there. But at times you you can't have too much uh, urine, too much liquid in there. So. Uh, what do you think about using like a separate Yeah, the the uh, uh, adding it to you. Oh, there's so many details to it. The urine part itself, if again, if it's not just directly going into the garden, you can just pour that in a lot of different areas and aren't going to be anywhere in your food crops. And you want enough moisture in the compost pile for the human or activity, but not too much. So if you get, if it's like, okay, that's pretty juicy already, but you got too much more. It is, relatively speaking, all things, it's safe to just pour around the perimeter and let it go from there. You don't want to put it in that garden compost, it's going to be quick to root crops and all that. But it, again, if you if if you don't have the disease, you're not spreading it, and it's not sterile. But it's not that bad either. So, so you don't like putting it in your garden? No, no. It, it's uh, in that it, addressing that, and I'm, I'm hedging a little bit because I know that Patrick and Richard and I have talked about it and others <clears throat> processing the urine so that it is safe to go into the garden is an unknown territory for most of us so far. Allegedly there's a couple of studies and some work that proves it and we can do this and it, let it sit, and do, which I'm not clear on so I'm not going to explain it, but if that tr appears, appears to be completely true and it makes complete sense that if you can kill the pathogens in the urine in a much, much shorter period of time than you're dealing with the solids, then you're able to, yes, put it out and just use it agriculturally in the field, but it, I'm not going to say do that because um, I'd rather see it composted for a year. I've, I've heard people say by putting the urine into the, the compost that you're going to put in the garden, it brings in a lot of nutrients into that. Now, I understand what you're saying about pathogens, but it depends on how quickly you turn your compost pile. Like if you're going to just put it in there for a couple, two or three months, then maybe not. But if you do your compost yearly, then it's probably okay, wouldn't you think? If you're doing it yearly and putting the urine in, it's yes, indeed, you're good to go. It's the, the biggest, it comes back to the same thing, the pathogens. You're just dumping urine directly into the garden, just, you know, raw from the bucket and it stinks and all that, because that will get rank. Trust me on that one. You know, that, that's rough at that point. Or just pouring into a garden composting pile you're introducing potentially pathogens and other issues that people have when they take a leak. So you don't want to do that to, to get it onto the food crops right away. Whereas the, the, what seems to be emerging is that, uh, and it may be some variation of what John was talking about with the fermentation where it's sealed off in the tanks and the pH levels change 
and it kills everything in there in terms of those pathogens and the bacteria and virus. In which case, after that, it's it's nutrient rich. It's ready to go. It's ammonia and all these other things that are in there. It is it's very high nutrient. It's excellent for the garden, except that you don't want to give it get diseases from it. Does that make sense? You know, it, I, I'd rather say he kept talking about not giving me diseases. Okay, you know, I wanted to use urine in the garden. He said, No, don't do it. I'll get a disease. So, you won't most of the time, and it's not that bad, but I, I don't want to say, oh, yeah, just go take a leak in the garden and have fun. You're asking for trouble there. If you were going to take a leak, you'd want to dilute it like 10 times. Yeah, that, well, that, I, what, what, wasn't Patrick saying something about that, yeah, about the dilution yeah. factor? I, I mean, mean, I was answering that yeah. from the standpoint of what do you do when you walk out with the buckets here? Yeah. Well, but I, would, I, would, I was assuming diluting it 10 to 1. That's what it is, yeah. And if you know people haven't been, like, taking antibiotics and things like that, and you know what, especially what you Yeah, do. I've also fermenting it. You know, does it feel all right, well, they for clear that I, that maybe I was I got the wrong track. Whatever, when it actually goes, when you're actually ready to use it after these other issues or get it out, the trees, all that, yeah, it's always diluted, just so you don't have to smell it as much as anything. But it's it's very concentrated nutrients. It's great stuff. You know, really, it comes back to why waste it? You got a, people working on a farm in an area. It's just put it back into the soil, close that circle, get that sustainable cycle back in track again. Grow good foods with it. <laughs> Nut trees, fruit trees. There are these people that do the analysis of the soil for the microbiology, and this lady analyzed the compost, and she said to this one guy, you've got the best microactivity I've ever seen. What do you do special with your compost? And he said, I put my pee in it every day. That's, that's why we're teaching the class. It's yeah. really fantastic. It really works. And the big caveat is don't start a plague. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I keep coming back to the same thing again. I, it, you know, it's to, to not like, oh, yeah, everybody just, you know, shit in a bucket and throw it in the yard. You'll be all right. And it, it doesn't do it. But, no, it's true. It, it, and it's crazy that we have this, at least in America, but it's, it's getting, you know, but at least in America, this disconnect between natural functions like this and the cycles of life, the gardening, you know, our own organics and all that is like. I, I would assume that he was doing that while he was loading it and then he walked away from it and let it age before he actually used it. It's not like he did that and then the next day he took it out to the garden. He let it age. We would hope so. But people do it. I can think of any number of workshops I've given where somebody gets up, oh, I pee in the garden all the time. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not what we're going for dinner tonight. You know, <laughs> you just, right. And that's just literally going out, we just stand there and pee. It, it, it's diluting it, letting it ferment, letting it age, letting it sit, letting it kill the stuff, and the compost. Oh, yeah, all that's fine. But that, that, that one of the 10,000, whatever it is, 50,000 times where all of a sudden, yeah, we had a lovely dinner over at Billy's and, oh man, we had the runs for a week. You know, what happened? Well, he pees in the garden. You know, I just want to, if it happens, it's not my fault. I've told you 12 times. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, maybe it could be like water testing. I mean, if you have a closed family situation where you may only have, you know, the same people for years and years. I get my water tested, you know, I try to do it every three to five years. It, you know, it costs a hundred, hundred and something dollars to send it off. Laboratory, they send you back what's in there. I mean, you could almost do the same thing. If you have a regimen where you, you know, you have this compost situation and you, and you uh, wait your year and you can maybe make a test. And you get the same people feeding into it. You get the same situation and just, you know, do it that way. I, I have no idea what a, you know, what a test costs for pathogens, but... You know, it might be an opportunity. Did you have a question? One of the one of the things that I've heard quite often today is moisture <laughs> can be a concern Absolutely. in composting. So it sounds to me like what you would need to do, let's say you go on a four year cycle. So you got a composting uh, pallet, 
uh, cage here, you got one here, you got one here, you got one here. Fill up the first one, fill up the second one, fill up the third one, fill up the fourth one, clean out the first one. But should you put a roof over it? That way you don't get a whole lot of rainwater at one time, and therefore you have a whole lot of moisture at one time. <laughs> and, you and you check it and you add moisture as you think that you could need it? That depends on the climate you're doing it in. You, well, you were mentioned right up here. here. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't bother with it. I wouldn't bother because that's been my experience. I had one on and uh, thinking it would be getting too much water, but it, it blew off into the woods. I finally got it back. Uh, and I just left it off. And it's uh, what happens. There's just two sides to that coin with it. If you got that too much water without the air coming in there and it goes anaerobic, it's not breaking down, and I kept saying all that. Once it's actually fully composted, what, what it, cause several people have told me this is, but once it's composted and sitting, if it keeps raining hard on it, you're not doing any damage to it, but you are leaching out a lot of the nutrients that are in there. So there's an argument, which I, which I would go for here, if you're gonna go beyond it, by the end of that first year, when it's finally done, just leave the lid off it, let it done, all the action, completely done, you're ready to go, you're not going to use it that year, put a lid on it, but still leave the air coming in from the sides and not leach as much of the nutrients out right into the ground right there, because that leachate is an issue from there. But I know that a couple of weeks ago in Transylvania County, they had, you know, they had a thunderstorm and so forth, and I mean, I don't know how much water it was, but they had flash floods in the whole nine yards. Good. And and in that process, if you had it covered, you wouldn't get as much moisture in it at one time as you would if you didn't have it covered. It's absolutely true, but you, it also, once it dries out, if you get that little bit of rain to keep it wet in between, you don't want to have it dry out either. Yeah, I, It's I, kind I, of an average thing. I can tell you that uh, in that one book I mentioned, uh, uh, Joe Jenkins, uh, uh -huh. uh, The Red Book, he has a, well actually it's in the other book too, it's a picture of, or a drawing. He has a three, a three bin design that is like, like that. So one's in the middle and the two, the opening for the middle one is this way and the opening for the other two are that it's way. Kind of like a triangle. Yeah. yeah, well not a triangle but a three, yeah. I don't know what you call it, like a, like a, like that. Okay. And he has a roof over the center, two gutters and two rain barrels. The center one is rain protected. The two outside ones are not, but the center one gets its moisture as needed from the rain barrels. So okay. if he can monitor that center one and feed it water as it needs it, but that's the one with the roof on. So you might want to look at the you know, okay. picture. You can probably get it online and look at it. So if there's no other questions, um, you know, I uh, really thank you all for coming here. And we do have the meal, as we said, but uh, um, you know, this is an ongoing experiment for us. We're, we're going to uh, continue to, uh, you know, finish this up and, and apply it as we, as we can. And, uh, you know, we'll have some, you know, we'll have some uh, additional information in the future, I would hope. Right. So. I would say thank you very much for everyone here for the workshop, the excellent questions and attention to the details as we went, and also for the viewers. Uh, I would stress again that there's an awful lot to this topic from all these different standpoints. So I'd highly encourage you to do more homework, to keep looking into it. But I hope your framework, the outline of what we presented here, uh, will guide that. So you, you look for the information what is the, between fermentation or the rain, and you know, there's so many little aspects. And keep in mind that there are a few things you have to do right but almost everything is really flexible. What are your particular needs? What are your particular designs? What are the parameters? Just keep in mind safety and sanitation and 99.9% .9 of the time, it's gonna work great for you. Thumbs up. Happy crapping. <laughs> <laughs>